Let's pray. Father, we ask for your blessing as we begin this study on the book of John. Father, I pray that the divine word, the one who is light, the one who has come into the world and enlightens everyone, Father, I pray that you would help us to see him with new eyes. Father, I pray that we would see our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and that we would behold his glory as we look at your word. Father, I pray that during this series that you would bring many to faith. I pray that the the glories and the excellencies of Jesus, the Son of God, would be on full display. Father, I pray that those of us that know Christ would be greatly strengthened in our faith, that we would be abiding with Christ, that we'd be bearing much fruit, that we would be useful for your kingdom. And so, Father, I pray that your spirit would come and would be with us today and in the coming weeks and months. I pray that Christ would be honored and glorified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you have probably guessed by the scripture reading and by what I just prayed, we are beginning today a, a journey that I'm really excited for, and that is a verse-by-verse study on the Gospel of John. And I'm not sure how long this will take, but uh, we're not going to go for a certain amount of time. It will be probably a lot longer than what I guess it will take. As you probably know, John is the fourth gospel in the New Testament, the fourth of four. There's a fourfold witness of the good news of Jesus Christ, of Christ's life, his death, his burial, resurrection, and ascension. And that fourfold witness is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. And we often refer to these Gospels as the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of John, and so on. But we shouldn't think when we're referring to it that way that there's four different Gospels. It's not four Gospels, it's only one Gospel, but there's four writers writing from different perspectives about the Gospel. Fairly soon after the Gospels were written, they were given these titles in Greek, kata iwanin, kata markon, and so on according to John, according to Mark. So even by that title there, you can tell what the purpose of the gospel is. They're not giving a different gospel. It's the gospel according to John, the gospel according to Mark. And if you're at the gospel of John right now, you just look up at the very top there, it probably says the gospel according to John. Do you see that? So each evangelist here was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write an account of the gospel, all from a different perspective and all for a different purpose. Now, for many Christians, I think John is probably their favorite gospel, uh, if we can speak of such things. Many Christians are extremely fond of John. John has one of the most glorious chapters, I think, in all of Scripture, which is the high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. There you see this glorious relation between God the Son and God the Holy Spirit and Jesus' love for his disciples as well as for us who will believe on account of the disciples' word. Jesus says, it's so precious. Uh, Jesus speaks of things like that he's the great shepherd in John. He doesn't speak of it in any of the other gospels. Uh, I'm the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. John has the most popular verse, the most well-known verse uh, today, which is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And I think even with that verse right there, you get a glimpse of what John is like. It's really, really simple, and yet it's really profound truth as well. St. Augustine, he said of this gospel that John was deep enough for an elephant to swim in and shallow enough for a child not to drown. I think that's a great description. How many of us grew up in the faith learning, memorizing verses from John and then you get older and you're like, there are, there are truths here that we'll never be able to plumb the depths of. John's like that. Well, let's look at what John is like here. Just some introductory comments. Well, first, who's the author? Who wrote the gospel according to John? Well, officially it's anonymous, as are the other gospels. None of the gospels have a title on the front of it that says it's written by so-and-so. 
But we do see that it's written by an eyewitness. If you look at John 21, verse 24, if you want to turn there, John 21, 24, this is the very end of the book here, and the author says this, this is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. This author bore witness in this book. He wasn't writing something that he knew nothing of or that he had no personal contact with. This author was someone in Jesus' inner circle, and he was a witness of all that Jesus said and did. This author was there when Jesus turned the water into wine. He was there when he said, Lazarus, come forth, and this dead man rose and came out of the tomb. He was there when he ran to the tomb with Peter and saw that the stone had been rolled away, and then Peter goes in first and sees that the body's no longer there. This, this should give us great confidence that what's being talked about in this gospel is historically true. This is written by an eyewitness. Uh, so sometimes there's a, there's, a, there's a common accusation that the world makes that we can't believe the Bible. The Bible is just a bunch of fairy tales. This is written by an eyewitness. He saw Jesus. He was with Jesus. He was laying on Jesus' side uh, at the Last Supper there. Uh, he heard Jesus. He, he, he touched him. Uh, so this is something that we can trust. Now, we know from the unanimous testimony of the early church fathers and evidence within John that the author here was John, the son of Zebedee. You'll remember that John and his brother James, they were fishermen working with their father Zebedee when Jesus called them to leave their nets and to follow him. And uh, John and James then became part of Jesus' inner circle, the 12 disciples. We see that initially they were very impulsive, they were very easily angered, uh, Jesus actually labels them as the sons of thunder. You remember that, the, uh, that John and James, that they told Jesus, they asked Jesus after the Samaritan town rejected Jesus, they said, Jesus, should we call down fire from heaven upon the Samaritan village? Very, very impulsive. But what's striking is we don't know them as the sons of thunder today. What do we know John as? The apostle of? The apostle of love. Uh, John wrote this gospel. He also wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, as well as Revelation. And one thing that we can see really clearly, especially in his letters, especially in 1st John, we can see the tender love that John has for other believers. His heart just draws out to them. He cares for them so dearly. And by the way, isn't that a great picture of the transforming power of Jesus and of the gospel? Someone who was a son of thunder becomes the apostle of love. Jesus is powerful to change anyone. He changed John. Now, the way that John refers to himself in this book uh, is not by his name. He doesn't refer to himself as John. In fact, when you see John in this book, it's John the Baptist. Uh, the other Gospels refer to John the Baptist by that title, John the Baptist. But interestingly, in this book here, the author refers to John the Baptist simply as John. Because John here is not differentiating himself from John the Baptist. So how does John refer to himself? It's by this glorious title the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's how he refers to himself again and again. The disciple whom Jesus loved. John knew the love of Christ that he had for him. And this is something that all of us as believers, we can say this as well. Paul said, Christ loved me and gave himself up for me. If we know Christ, we can say, Christ loved me. I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. And I think if you're to choose, if you're writing a gospel and you're to choose between your own name and between the title, the disciple whom Jesus loved, I don't think that's a hard choice. Well, much of what we know in John is unique from the other gospels. You probably know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're called the synoptic, gospel, the synoptic gospels. And the reason for that is, is because uh, they have a synthesis. There's a lot of overlap between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. A lot of the material is covered in each one. There's a different slant. There's a lot of added, especially Matthew uh, and Luke, but they're, they're very similar. John is very different. Uh, John doesn't include an awful lot of things that the other Gospels include. Here's some of the things that, that John does not include. He does not include Jesus' birth, his years growing up, his baptism. There's no parables at all in John. Just striking. I hadn't thought of that before. There's not a single parable in John. There's no mention of the transfiguration, of the institution of the Lord's Supper, or Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. 
We might say, well, why is that? Why does John not include all those things? Well, I think it's because John was the last gospel written, almost certainly the last gospel written. And the author knew of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and he didn't see it necessary to include those details that the other gospel writers had already included in their account. It's been said that John, that 90% of John is not in the other three gospels, 90%. For example, there's things like this, turning the water into wine, that's in John 2, but that's not in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Uh, you have the dialogue with Nicodemus. That's not in any of the other Gospels. You have the Samaritan woman in John 4. That's not in the other Gospels. The seven I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. All those are not in any of the other Gospels. They're only in John. Even strikingly, the resurrection of Lazarus, raising Lazarus from the dead, that's not in any of the go other Gospels. It's only in John. Well, why did he include these things here and then not include other things? Well, the reason is, John had a very particular purpose in writing his gospel. Now, if you're still in John 21, look at John chapter 20. We see John's purpose statement in this book. John 20, verses 30 and 31. And this is something that, as we're going through the gospel of John here, keep this in mind. John has a particular agenda, a particular purpose in his writing. Uh, he's not including everything that he could have included about Jesus. There's actually... He says, there's many, many things I did not include. If I were to include everything, he said, all the books would not be able to contain all that Jesus did. So John is purposely selecting different things from Jesus' life and different sayings that he had uh, for a purpose. Well, here's the purpose. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So John selected the material that he selected for the purpose that we might come to believe that Jesus is the Christ. The word Christ is another word for the Messiah. It's just a translation of that word that we may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the son of David. But he's more than the son of David. That, that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God. Jesus is not a mere man. He's not a mere good man. He's not a mere prophet, but he's the very son of God. There's no other gospel of the four gospels. There's no other gospel that so clearly highlights the deity of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Matthew highlights that Jesus is the promised king in the line of David who has come to bring the kingdom of God. Mark focuses on Jesus as the suffering servant who's come to give his life as a ransom for many. Luke points out that Jesus is the perfect Son of Man who's come to bring salvation not only for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. And John emphasizes far more than any other gospel that Jesus is God himself who has come to earth. The gospel of John has been compared to entering the most holy place. Remember the most holy place? That's, that's a part of the, the temple where God's presence uniquely dwelt with his people back in the Old Testament. The Gospel of John, in a way, is like that, if you can, pick, can compare it to it in that way. You see the glories of Christ, the glories of God, on full display, perhaps like no other book in all of Scripture, in the Gospel of John. You have God incarnate, God taking on human flesh, revealing his glory, showing that he is indeed the Son of God in the Gospel of John. Well, what happens as we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? And the answer is, it says in verse 31, we may have life in his name. And that's a huge theme. We'll see again and again. We'll look at that more in detail next week. The theme of life is pervasive throughout the Gospel of John. Um, as we believe in Jesus Christ, when we first come to trust in him, in this world of um, death, in, the, in this world of uh, condemnation that we have because of our sin, um, in Jesus Christ there's life. And it's life that's not going to end. It's eternal life that's to be had. And it's only to be had in Jesus Christ. So the whole purpose of this book is he wants to show forth that Jesus is the Christ. He's the, the long-awaited Messiah, but he's the son of God. He's, he's God himself. And he wants all of us to believe in Jesus Christ, that he is that. And as we come to believe in Jesus Christ, we will have life. So this is a great book for, for unbelievers as well as for believers. Uh, this is, this would, it's always a good thing to invite people to church. We should always be 
uh, reaching out to friends and family and inviting them to church. We want them to come and to worship with us, to learn about Jesus, uh, to hear the gospel. The gospel of John, for however long we're going to be going through this, this is going to be a really, really great series to invite your unbelieving friends to come to church. Because again and again, we're going to see, um, from different angles, a vision of who Christ is. We're going to see the, the life that there is to be had in Jesus Christ. But this is also, of course, a book for believers as well. In John chapter, uh, I think it's John chapter 15, John chapter 15, Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit in itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So for those, of us, for those of us that are believers, our call is to keep looking to Jesus, to keep abiding in Jesus. It's only as we are abiding in Jesus that we can bear fruit. In this world with so many distractions, uh, there's so many burdens, uh, and the sin that we're dealing with, we need to keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus Christ. Amen? And, and John is so helpful in um, putting in front of us a, a different glimpse of Jesus, a different glimpse of Jesus, a different glimpse of Jesus to encourage us to keep looking, keep trusting in Jesus Christ. So my, one of my prayers for this series is that your faith would grow greatly as week after week we behold the Son of God. All right, let's look at our text. John 1, 1 through 3. Now, this section here is part of a larger section called the prologue. The prologue is verses 1 through 18. And much of what's said in this prologue here is going to be covered later on in the book. Uh, things like Jesus is divine, that in him is life, that he is the light coming into the world of darkness, that Jesus has revealed his glory, and so on. Uh, one way that you can think of the prologue here is like a trailer for a movie. You see a, a trailer for a movie right now, Avengers Endgame is out in theaters right now. If you see a trailer for uh, Avengers Endgame, you're going to see all these different clips of what the movie is about. You're going to see Captain America, you're going to see uh, Thor, uh, and all the other superheroes. You'll see different tiny clips. And then if you go and see the movie, you'll say, oh, I, I, I saw that, I recognize that from the trailer. Well, that's in a way what John is doing here. He's putting the trailer... Uh, up front here, so you can be introduced to what this whole book is going to be like. In a way, this is like a, a summary, an introductory summary of the entire book. And what John does here in these first few verses is he begins with a full, radiant view of the glory of Christ. You might expect for John to begin subdued and then to work up to a climax as he's telling the gospel uh, regarding Jesus. You might think of it, it might be like a, a fireworks show. It's going to start off relatively small, and then at the end, there's going to be this grand finale. Well, in a way, what John does here is he takes the grand finale, and he puts it at the beginning, so that we could see this awesome, glorious, majestic display of Jesus Christ. And what he does here in verses 1, verses 1 through 3, is he starts by introducing the Word. If you look at verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Greek word there is logos. In the beginning was the logos. Now, keep in mind that the word that John's talking about here is Jesus Christ. If you look at verse 14, it says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. This word is Jesus. The word here, this phrase that John's using in verse 1, this is John's introductory and summarizing title for Jesus Christ. And you might think, that sounds kind of strange. Why would you use, if you're going to uh, tell, uh, tell the gospel, tell, tell the story of the good news of Jesus Christ, why would you refer to Jesus as the word? You might think, that doesn't sound like a grand finale to start off a book. That seems really puzzling. Well, it, it is a grand finale. Uh, let me see if I can explain why. Well, the word logos, the word word, that was used really common in the first century. Uh, some have claimed, and that's where, that's where John's drawing from, from Greek, uh, Greek thought. The Stoics understood logos as the principle of reason behind all things. And the Greek philosopher Philo, he saw logos as this ideal world that kind of stood behind the things that we see. It's kind of a platonic thought that Philo had. So this word logos was used often in first century Greek. But I don't think that's where John's drawing from. I don't think he's drawing from the Stoics or from Philo. 
I think he's, what he's drawing from is from the Old Testament. And the reason why I think that is because of what he begin, how he begins. He says, in the beginning was the word. And when we hear that, what do you think of? You think of Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created all things by his powerful word, we know. God said, let there be light, and instantly there's light that existed. We also see in the Old Testament that God reveals himself to others through his word. We see again and again phrases like, the word of the Lord appeared to so-and-so, or the word of the Lord came to so-and-so. Usually it's a prophet, Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel. Uh, The word of the Lord comes to this prophet, and there's this revelation that God gives of himself to this prophet, and then the prophet then gives that revelation to the people. We also see God's word bringing about deliverance or judgment in the Old Testament. So Psalm 107, verse 20, says, God sent out his word, and he healed them, and delivered, delivered them from their destruction. So thinking about creation, how God created all things, thinking about how God reveals himself uh, through his word going to prophets or to uh, other individuals, uh, thinking about how God brings about salvation and judgment through his word. What then is the word of God? The word of God is God's ultimate revelation and self-expression. It's God's ultimate revelation and self-expression. And I think we can get an idea of this by the way that uh, with our own speech. When we're speaking, that's a reflection of who we are, of our minds, of our inner person. Um, Jesus says, out of the overflow of the heart, the what? The mouth speaks. So what we say reveals what's inside us. We get to know someone well by what they're saying. For John then to refer to Jesus as the word is to say that Jesus is none other than God's ultimate self-disclosure. God's ultimate revelation of himself. Jesus is God's son, and he reveals to us who God is. So what is this word like? Well, we see four glorious descriptions meant to make you marvel at this word, at Jesus Christ. So here's the first description. This word is eternal. This word is eternal. John says, in the beginning was the word. So again, this takes us all the way back to Genesis 1-1. It takes us back to creation. When God created everything, that's when time and space and matter, all of that began at that point. Before creation, there was absolutely nothing. Uh, There was a void. Nothing existed at all. The only one that existed was, of course, God himself. There was not a time when God did not exist. When everything else began, when that happened in the very beginning, God still was. And that's why it says, in the beginning, God. Then he created the heavens and the earth. So God predates the beginning. You can't can't say that my my kids ask me this all the time and say, well, we just can't understand this. They'll say, say, Daddy, when when did God begin? And I'll say, well, God didn't have a beginning. At the very beginning, that's when God made everything. But that's not when God began. God has always been. And you can kind of, especially Seth, they see his eyes kind of go up a little bit. Doesn't make sense, but that's what the Bible teaches. And here, what John does is he compares the word with God, and he says, in the beginning was the word. So notice, he doesn't say, in the beginning began the word. It says, in the beginning was the word. And even that word was there, that's a very purposeful word. Uh, The Greek tense there for that word was is in the imperfect tense. It's not just a simple past action, a simple past uh, state of being. Uh, The imperfect tense implies something that is continuous. So if you go all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to creation, the word, who is Jesus, was already existing continuously. Jesus has always existed. In AD 319, there's a deacon in Alexandria whose name was Arius, who presented a, a letter to Bishop Alexander. And he argued that if the Son of God were truly a son, then he must have had a beginning. Uh, If he's truly the Son of God, then he argued that there must have been a time when Jesus did not exist. Well, Arius was not paying attention to passages like John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word. 
Back at the beginning, Jesus already existed. Jesus is eternal. And we see this confirmed in verse 2 where it says, He was in the beginning with God. So here's the amazing thing that John is saying. Just as God is eternal, he has no beginning at all. He's before all things. So also, the word here is eternal. He goes back before all things. This is what Scripture consistently teaches. Here's just some other passages. In Colossians 1.17, it says, He is before all things. And they're speaking of Jesus Christ. Jesus is before all things. In Revelation 1.4, it says, Grace to you and peace from him, and this is speaking of Jesus, from him who is and who was and who is to come. There couldn't be a more clear description of Jesus' eternality than that. He is, he was, and he is to come. And then in Revelation 22.13, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's the beginning letter in the Greek alphabet. That's the ending letter in the Greek alphabet. That's another way of Jesus saying, I have no beginning at all and no end at all. I always exist. He says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So this word, this self-disclosure, this ultimate revelation from God is eternal. Second, we see that the word is in fellowship with God. John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. For John to say that the word was with God, that speaks of this fellowship that there has always existed between the word and between God. The Greek word here for with is the word pros, and it has a range of meanings here in this tense. It can mean to, towards, or with. But one thing that's interesting is whenever it means with, almost, almost always, uh, it frequently speaks of when a person is with another person. When it means with, it speaks of a person being with another person. Let me, let me show you some examples of that. In Mark 6, 3, this is the people of Nazareth speaking of Jesus. He says, aren't his sisters here with us? So people with people. The people of Nazareth say, aren't, aren't his sisters, Jesus' sisters, with us? In 2 Corinthians 5, 8, Paul says, we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. We, a person, would rather be with the Lord, another person. And then Philemon 13, it says, I would have liked to keep him, referring to Onesimus, with me. Paul's saying, I want this, this slave, who's a brother in the Lord, I want him to be with me. So whenever we see this Greek word pros being used, and it means with, it's almost always speaking of a person with a person. So th this is striking. The Stoics, they viewed Lagos as an impersonal force. Kind of a creator, it stands behind things. But John's saying, no, this eternal word, this is a person. Eternally, this word has been in fellowship with God. There's been this, this blessed, wonderful communion between the word and between God. Think of John 1.18. If you just look later down in, uh, in the first chapter here, John says, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. There we see that fellowship. Jesus is from the Father's side, eternally at the Father's side. Some translations have at the Father's bosom. He has made him known. So if someone says, well, how can we know that Jesus is really God's ultimate self-disclosure, that he really reveals God to us? We hear that a lot today. How do, you, how do you know that Jesus really is the way to the Father? Well, the answer is, he eternally has been in perfect, blessed fellowship with God. The word was with God. Third, the word is divine. The word is divine. And this is an astounding statement. The pre-existent word that was in fellowship with God for all eternity is also fully and truly God. Colossians 2.9, it speaks of Jesus and it says, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. It's not the part of deity. It's not a portion of deity. The whole fullness of deity dwells in Jesus in bodily form. We shouldn't think of the word here as being any less than God. For, for John to say the word was God, he's saying the word here is fully and truly, completely God. And in this verse here, in John 1.1, 1, 1, we have one of the most simple and comprehensive statements of who God is. This is such an amazing revelation of the Trinity here. We see that there's, first, there's distinction in the Godhead. 
The word is with God. There's different persons in the Godhead. They're distinct from one another. We shouldn't conceive of God as oneness Pentecostals do. They're a, a very large uh, group, large sect, uh, around one million here just in the United States. And they believe that God is one person who reveals himself in different modes at different times. And some of them say, for example, that in the Old Testament, God revealed himself as God the Father. In the Incarnation, God revealed himself as God the Son. And then from Pentecost on, God reveals himself as the Holy Spirit. So you can think of it as um, basically the different descriptions of God is like a mask that God wears. Here he's God the Father, then he takes that off, puts on another mask. Here he's God the Son, and then he's God the Holy Spirit. Well, no, this passage here teaches that God is simultaneously three co-equal persons. The word is eternal. He's always been with God, but there's also a distinction. The word is with God. They're different persons. So here we see two of the persons of the Godhead, the Father and the Son, and later on we'll see the Holy Spirit introduced. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So that's one truth. There's distinction in the Godhead. But what else do we see? We also see that there's unity in the Godhead as well. This word that's distinct from God is also God. So we shouldn't think that the Bible teaches that there's three gods. God the Holy Spirit is a God. Then you have another God, God the Son. And then you have a, a third God, God the Father. No, they're, they're distinct. There's different persons. But the way that uh, Christian tradition has taught us and what the scriptures teach us here as well is that it's one divine essence, but it's three co-eternal persons. Now, if a Jehovah Witness came to your door and uh, they're talking to you about Jesus and you brought to them to this passage here, John 1.1, 1, 1, you share that with them, what would they say to you? Well, they would say that the translation here is wrong. It, it doesn't actually say that the word was God it says, it should say that the word was a God. And their new world translation actually has that. It says, uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word is with God, and the word was a God. So they'll say, uh, Jesus is not uh, of the exact same divine essence as God the Father. Uh, Jesus, um, Jesus is a heavenly being. Uh, let me find my place here. He's a heavenly being created by Jehovah as the archangel Michael and is a lesser God. Now, why would they say this? Well, they'll say this because the word for God here at the very end of verse 1, theos, it doesn't have the definite article before it. So they'll say, what John's saying here, it's not the one true God, it's open-ended. Jesus is a God. He's a lesser God than Jehovah. So how would you respond to this? Maybe you've had this conversation with a Jehovah Witness. How do you respond to this assertion here? Well, there's two answers. One I just want you to be aware of. I don't expect you to remember this at all. But one you can be able to keep in mind. Uh, and you can see that for sure uh, that John is indicating that Jesus is fully divine. So the, the first here has to do with Greek grammar. So it's true. When the Jehovah Witnesses say that there's no definite article between, before Theos, that's true. But the reason why John doesn't put a definite article before Theos is not because he's thinking of many gods. But the reason is he's showing us that theos here is to be in the predicate position. So uh, you have to keep in mind the English that you learned maybe a long time ago. Um, if you have a subject and you have a verb, later on you have, you have the predicate following the verb. And this is what you have at the very end here. You have the word, that's the subject, was, that's the verb, and then you have God, uh, or a God as the Jehovah Witnesses say. In English, uh, the order of words is really, really important. If I would say, I like dogs, that makes sense. Uh, but if I would say, if I would move the words around, if I said dogs like I, that wouldn't make any sense. So the order in English is really important. But in Greek, a lot of times the order is all over the place. And so you can kind of know uh, what each word is doing by the case ending, by the end of it. But you can especially know uh, when it's in this arrangement here, by whether or not there's a definite article. So John here, by dropping this definite article for God, what he's doing is signaling that God here is in the predicate position. The word here has the definite article, and John's signaling that then is in the subject position. So what he's, what he's saying is this. He's saying, 
We should read it as the word was God, not God was the word. That, that's how he's signaling it without having the article be, before the word God. This is called the Colwell rule. Uh, Greek scholars, they uh, supposedly they all affirm this, so this is not some abstract thing at all. Um, just keep that in mind. The only reason I share that with you, you're not expected to remember that. I don't expect that at all. But just keep in mind, there is an answer to the accusation. That, that's the main point that I want you to keep in mind. There is an answer to the accusation. It, it does not mean the word was a God. It doesn't mean that at all. But here's what you can keep in mind. And um, this is an important principle here. You can almost always understand what a passage is saying by just being a careful reader. If you read the Bible carefully, you can know what John's saying here. And if you just read a little bit before and a little bit after, you can tell John is indeed saying that Jesus is truly and fully God. Now you can already pick it up because we've already seen that the word is eternal. Well, who's eternal but God? Uh, you can already see it by it says that the word is with God. He's always been in fellowship with God. But look at what John says right after this. This brings us to our fourth point. The word is creator of all things. Look at verse 3. John says, all things were made through him. All things were made through him, referring to this word. Jesus is the agent of all creation. Again and again in the Old Testament, what we read is that God and God alone is the one who made all things. In Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Psalm 96.5, it says, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. What are the, all, all, what are all the idols of, uh, of the peoples of the earth? What have they made? They made nothing. But in contrast to all the idols, God has made the heavens. God made all things. God alone is the creator of all things. So what then does it mean for, Je for John to say of Jesus, all things were made through him? He's saying this word here is God. If God alone is the creator and this word made all things, that means Jesus is truly and fully God. So if you meet a, a, a Jehovah Witness friend, you can just take him right to verse 3. Say, look, John is speaking of God himself. The word is fully and truly God. Now the Jehovah Witness, they might say, well, yes, all things were made through Jesus except for Jesus himself. Jesus is the first created being of Jehovah as the archangel Michael. And after he was created, then he created all things. But here's where John is so helpful. Praise God for how clear John is. Look what John says right after this at the end of verse three. All things are made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. So here he's saying there's absolutely no exception to that which was created. Jehovah Witnesses, they say there is one thing that's accepted that Jesus Christ made, and that's himself. Jehovah made Jesus, and then Jesus is the agent for the rest of the creation. John says, no, no, no. All things were made through Jesus, and without Jesus was not anything made that was made. Jesus created absolutely everything. Therefore, Jesus is not a created being. Therefore, Jesus is fully and truly God. So brothers and sisters, the word is eternal. The word is in fellowship with God. The word is divine. And the word is the creator of all things. And amazingly, verse 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us 2,000 years ago. Isn't that amazing? This eternal word, this word that has perfect fellowship with God, this word that is fully divine, this word that has made everything right now, this word, this self-disclosure of God, this full revelation of God, he became one of us. You can't think of a more explosive, dynamic, awesome way to begin a gospel. The one that we worship is God himself. Have you lost sight of how amazing this is? Have you grown dull to the fact that we worship God himself? That God himself has revealed himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ? How this should increase your awe and your joy and your wonder and your amazement. How this should make us explode in praise to God. 
How can we not go to others, to our friends, our family, our relatives, uh, people in town? How can we not go to them and say, I want to tell you about um, someone who, uh, a person just like you and me, but is actually God himself that came to earth so that you might have life. We have the greatest news in all the world, and it's not even close. One second. Jesus Christ, God himself, has come to earth that we might have life. How this should make us fall on our face in amazement and exclaim, Jesus is the Son of God who became flesh, and by believing in him, I have life. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we praise you for the incredible love that you have, ha have shown to us. That you would not leave us in the dark, but you gave the full and final revelation of yourself in Jesus. I, I think of what it says in Hebrews. For long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to us by his prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us par excellence by his son, Jesus Christ. So Father, I pray that we would be attentive that we would be humble, and that we would have a heart of worship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.